The Bible says that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not counting our sins against us. He made Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin for us. Operation Footstool. The Hebrew word, Operation Footstool, it comes from Psalms 110.1. Psalms 110.1. Psalms 10, 110, 1, Psalms 110, 1, all right? And remember in Hebrew, you read from the right to the left. This word here in the Hebrew is R-E-G-E-L, R-E-G-E-L, that's foot. And then we have over here, we have H-A-D-O-M. Stool, footstool, because it comes from prophecy. It's a messianic prophecy of 1101. Operation footstool. So, you know, if you'd like that word up there, just because it's Hebrew, when you get to point one, I was going to write it in there and I forgot to do it. So I had to put it on the board for you. That's how it's written. Uh, last week, if you recall, last week in Hebrews, the 10th chapter, 11 through 13, we learned that was one Greek sentence. I divided it in two parts of study because verse 11 and 12 deal with the first coming of Christ. Hey, Rick, would you do me a favor? Only thing we have to do is maybe rearrange these two ladies. I forgot to do this and bring Jane, Je since we got so much room up here, would you push her up to the front? No, we're coming to the front now. Just let her through there. And I'm in trouble now, Johnny. Is she smiling, Johnny, or is she frowning? Get, oh, yeah. Well, I can see why you do you. <laughs> right there in the corner. I uh, know. Yeah. Look at Boy, Linda knows you really well. I mean, Glenda knows you really well, doesn't she? Brought that pudding. Thank you. All right. If you would, when we leave today, if you'd say a special prayer for me, I'm away. <laughs> she loves you. Ah, she, it's moment by moment. That song, you know, Jesus, moment by moment. <laughs> moment by moment. Um, anyhow, I divide. <laughs> I divided Hebrews 10, 11 through 13, one, one Greek sentence in two part because verse 11 and 12 deal with the first coming of Christ and verse 13 deals with the second coming of Christ. Now remember that in the Old Testament, for example, when he's going to tell you this in Psalms 110, they didn't, know, they didn't talk about a first coming and a second coming of Christ because the church age separates them. And they did, that's a mystery. That was the mystery doctrine. And so when you read Old Testament passages that are messianic, you have to really pay attention to them to figure out if it's first coming or second coming because we just know it's the coming of Christ. Are you with me? We talk about, and, and listen to me. <laughs> That's why dispensational teaching is so important. why it's really important you need to know there's a jewish age you need to know that there that there's a difference between a jewish age and a church age and a millennial age to put your doctrines correct correct in, in the teaching of the coming of christ you have to know that or otherwise your theology just gets really screwy so and and look i don't fuss with guys who say well i don't believe in dispensation i say well do you believe in ages do you believe there was a jewish age a church age if they say that, then I go, well, good. I'm not going to fuss with them about terms because now we believe the same thing. 
Yeah. It's only a technical difference. I've learned over the years to try to find common ground for learning. I found that works the best. I just try to find common ground and work from there. So, last week we looked at the first coming of Christ in verse 11, 12, and tonight we're going to look at a very interesting subject called Operation Footstool. And um, you could probably be in church all your life and never hear this doctrine. All your life. And it doesn't mean you weren't in a good church. It just means that somebody didn't pay attention to this aspect of the second coming of Christ, which deals with the angelic conflict. I mean, it's an enormous doctrine. And what I found interesting, what the Lord did really well, not because I was smart to think it, but because he was just smart to think ahead of me. He put tonight's lesson and tomorrow's night's lesson together back to back, and that tomorrow night's really going to help you. But anyhow, last week we learned the doctrinal importance of the Old Covenant freestanding. Agreed? Standing, right? Yes. Come on now. Jeez, I haven't had a word of prayer. Maybe, maybe that's the problem. I should have a word of prayer first. <laughs> no, I have a word of prayer for my sake. Let's have a word of prayer and I'm going to come back to this. Give you a moment of silence to believe a priest. Remember, the Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. You can't study it nor apply it in carnality. Evidence of carnality is personal sin. It could be in three categories at least, but three main ones. That would be mental attitude, sin, sins of the tongue, or vert sins. We've been talking about sins of the tongue on Sunday. Bridle your tongue, James said. What should I do? How do I recover from carnality? Well, you confess your sin, First John 1, 9. If we confess our sin, then he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us. What a wonderful thing that is. And that restores us to spirituality, the ministry of the Holy Spirit. He's the spirit of truth, and he will teach you truth tonight if you have ears to hear. And so, our Father, we thank you tonight for these that have come our way to study with us by automobile and by Internet. We pray those who have dropped in on the Internet. Um, we've been in this subject matter of the new covenant for weeks, chapters 8, 9, and 10. And uh, we're at verse 13 in chapter 10, walking our way through the superiority of the new covenant over the old covenant. That's why it was replaced. Jesus Christ came to take away the first in order to establish the second covenant, the new covenant. And so I pray you would stay. We still have many many studies, and then you can go back to our, you can, they can go back, Father, to our, our internet, and they can pull up all of the previous studies, a wealth of information on the new covenant that they should know about because we all live in the new covenant. So I pray for those who are with us by internet that may have not known those things, make that clear. I pray tonight the Holy Spirit would minister the truth of this word of God into our souls and beyond in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, last week we talked about the old pre-stand, the old covenant pre-standing, and it meant he stood because the work of redemption wasn't completed. Christ would come. He would die on that cross. He would complete redemption. He would return to the Father and be seated. The, our high priest is seated because the work is completed. And so we talked about that because in verse 12, he talks about that. He says, and not through the blood of goats and calves, but through his own blood, he entered the holy place, heaven, once for all, that session for us, having obtained eternal redemption. The session of Jesus Christ is during the church age, seated at the right hand of God, the Father in heaven. The writer of Hebrews 10, 13 reminds us that when he says, uh, I think that's in, is that in verse 12? Would somebody look and see if that, is that at the end of verse 12 or is that in verse 13? Waiting, 13, okay. Waiting, waiting from the time, from the time seated onward until his enemies be made a footstool for his feet. Jesus says, will be in session until he leaves the seat and returns. Are you with me? That's called Operation Footstool. 
look, look where it comes from. Until he, until his enemies be made a footstool for his feet. Do you see that? How did King James say that? There you go. Same thing. Same thing. King James. It, that's that's him seated at the right hand of God, the Father, in charge of the of of everything until the second coming of Christ. Yep, that's absolutely right, William. Now, I know. Now, that's what I love about you, and I'm going to keep telling. I got to tell you ten times, but I I'm, I want to honor that. Uh, point number one: the main old covenant prophecy of Operation Footstool is the Psalms 110:1. So I want you to turn in your Bibles to Psalms 110:1. If you have difficulty finding it, uh, go to your go to your index or your at, at the open at the um, index at the contents of your Bible, and it'll give you a page number for Psalms and just Psalms one ten one. Yeah, Psalms one ten one. It's a messianic psalm. It's uh, loaded with all kinds of information. It's a short psalms, but it's full of all kinds of information on the coming of Christ. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, but I, but thank you. No, that's fine. But I want you to see three parts to it, and I put it on your paper. I want you to see three. I, I gave you an outline of this text. A sovereignty, session, and second coming. Do you see that on your paper under point one? Well, this is how this goes. Here's sovereignty. The Lord said to my Lord. Those are both capital L's. The Lord said to my Lord. Session, set at my right hand. See, that means session. Now, we know that from New Covenant teaching. Then the second coming, until set at my right hand, <clears throat> until I make your enemies the footstool for your feet. That's the second coming. So I, I gave you an outline of that <laughs> scripture based on S words. <clears throat> you know, that's what I like to do. So that's a homiletical outline uh, for that verse. It is our key verse that that goes with our text, which is Hebrews 10, 13. The idea of Operation Footstool is the victor of warfare putting his foot upon the neck of the defeated enemy. That's where this comes from. It's a military concept out of the Old Covenant, out of the day. For example, when Joshua, Joshua beat the five uh, Amorite kings, he did that. You can read about it in Joshua, the 10th chapter. You can read about the victory, the warfare, the victory, and Joshua actually doing this. <clears throat> and this is what that meant in the ancient world. By the way, probably more famous to the average reader of the Bible is David and Goliath. David did it with Goliath. In 1 Samuel 17, and then verse 21, it expands information on that. My point is, what does Operation Footstool mean? There's a definition of it. I mean, that's the definition of the meaning of footstool. There's a doctrine that goes with that. So the second thing I would like to have you pay attention, and remember Psalms, did you, did you get this in your head? Psalms 110.1 is a messianic Psalms. It's a big deal. The whole thing is messianic. <laughs> Here's the second thing. Operation Footstool will involve two great wars and victories against Satan and his angels. That's We call them fallen angels at the second coming of Jesus. Here's the first victory. The first victory is that Jesus Christ, and I'm talking about Operation Footstool now. The first victory, Jesus Christ will defeat Satan. Now, I'm going to talk more about this. I'm just introducing it. Jesus Christ will defeat Satan and his angels at the Battle of Armageddon, which probably most people have hear, heard about, and will put them in the Tyrus, or called the Abyss, for the millennial period, that thousand-year reign called the millennium. You can read about this in Revelation 16, 16. The longer passage that would be Revelation 19, 11 through the 20th chapter, verse 7. 
and 2 Peter 2, 4, which is a key passage, I would circle that, for identity of the name of the angelic prison in Sheol, Tar Taurus. The second victory, now remember, a warfare in the second coming of Christ is the battle of Armageddon at the end of the trib. That's a big deal because Satan and the fallen angels are put in prison, right, in Sheol, in this place called the prison, the angelic prison. The second victory, the second victory of Operation Footstool, Jesus Christ will defeat Satan and his angels after being released from the angelic prison at the battle of Gog and Magog, and then they will be cast into a lake of fire. And we'll talk more about that tomorrow night, but we have been dealing with that uh, pretty, uh, we've, I think, I think we're three lessons deep in the angelic conflict or maybe, maybe four. <clears throat> Revelation 27 through 10 and Matthew 25, 41. So Operation Footstool, this is a very big deal. It, it was covered in the Old Covenant. It has been brought to light and, and is part of the teaching of the second coming of Christ. It, it is a major doctrine in the angelic conflict, Operation Footstool. I mean, it is amazing. Now, a lot of, a lot of great preachers out there preaching on the second coming of Christ, they preach about the battle of Armageddon. They preach about the battle of Gog and Magog and don't tell you what, what is the cause behind it all and what's going to happen. And these are great victories in the angelic conflict as this whole thing winds down to the end of human history. These are big deals. I just wanted you to, I'm just trying to coach you along in this, in this concept. Now, here's my point three. Psalms 110.1 is quoted, I'm going to mention it four times. There are four times that I want to bring this that's, that's quoted. Psalms 110 is, is quoted four times in the New Testament of importance to my study. And so I'm bringing these four times out to you tonight <laughs> under the New Testament, out of the New Testament in New Covenant period to distinguish a difference between the teaching of the first coming and the second coming of Jesus Christ. Now, I'm going to list them in the order that, they, uh, that you find them in the New Testament. So we're going to start with the book of Matthew. <clears throat> okay. Put your eyes on it. Matthew 22. Let's just take a look at it. Matthew 22. Because now we're in our territory. We're, we're in what we call the New Testament or the, the New Covenant teaching. When all this comes together with, through the, in, the incarnation of Christ through the four Gospels. I'm in Matthew 22. And, and this thing goes from. I, I think I picked it up in 34 just to show you the identity, 22, 34. He's talking to the, when the Pharisees heard that he had put the Sadducees to silence on the issue of resurrection, they gathered themselves together. And one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him. And he asked, teacher, what is the great commandment? And so he goes into that. He goes into that discussion. That's not my subject. Drop down to 41. He goes, into, he, he goes and answers that. Now, while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them a question. And this is the one I'm interested in. Not that the other one wasn't important. And was, it wasn't that Jesus didn't answer it. But it's not part of my subject matter tonight. But this one is. He said to them, what do you think about Christ? Whose son is he? They said to him, well, of course, the son of David. He said that to them. Then how does David in the spirit call him Lord with a capital L? I mean, how, how is it that he calls him God? Well, if he's the son of David, how is it possible that David calls him God? The Lord God. Now look what he does in verse 44. 
Here's his proof text. It's what we call a proof text. The Lord said to my Lord, capital L's, set up my right hand until I put thine enemies beneath thy feet. Right? That's Psalms 110.1, right? You got a study Bible? Cross references? There it is. And probably give you some of the other places that is found as well. Then he says, if David then called him Lord, how is he his son? Because he was David's son. The Messiah Christ is the son of David. But he didn't call him son. He called him Lord. And so he's trying to make a point. When the Messiah comes, whose son will he be? He's got to be virgin born. It's not, it can't come through. He's got to come through the lineage, but not, not through the copulational system of David, right? It's called the virgin birth. Say, so, listen, guys, you guys are the leader of theology, right, Nicodemus? Oh, wait, wait a minute. How is, it, how is it that you don't know these things? And verse 46 says, and no one was able to give him a word. Nor did anyone dare from that day forward to ask him another question. Isn't that interesting? You know what I know about this? In his humanity, Jesus Christ was a great student of the word of God. And he knows that the devil always tries to trip us up on the little things that should be big things. See, Jesus saw, see, the Pharisees saw a little L. Jesus saw a big L. And there's a whole world of difference between that, isn't there? You can be that same kind of a Bible student, by the way, because you have the Holy Spirit to teach you. You can be that same Bible student. But listen, when you grab a hold of a passage, you got to sit on it for a while and let the Holy Spirit teach it to you rather than just read through and check it off. People say, well, I read through the Bible 26,000 times. Yeah, but what's stuck? I'm not opposed to that. If you read it and you sit on it and let the Holy Spirit teach you, tell you what it really says, because this is a really big deal, wasn't it? Because they saw that as a little L. And it actually was a big L. That changed that whole meaning. Well, then whose son is he? Is that not a big issue in the, in the new covenant? They hadn't even paid any attention to it. Here Jesus Christ is 30 years of age. They haven't paid any attention to this factor. Well, he's probably older than that in chapter 22, probably 33. Here's another one, Acts 2. This is Peter at Pentecost. Ooh, hello, Peter. Where have you been? Well, I left the fire. I was sitting by a fire um, telling everybody I didn't know who Jesus Christ was, and I didn't want to hear about it anymore. What happened, Peter? We got indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God, and the Holy Spirit became the witness that Jesus said he would be. When the Spirit comes upon you, you will be a witness. You will be a witness of me. And here is Peter. Listen, telling, telling all of us, this is what it means to be a witness for Jesus Christ. That's having the ability to speak the truth of the Word of God. Anybody can talk about the Bible, but how about the truth of it? The truth is what sends people. Listen, you can talk to anybody about the Bible. It's the truth of the Bible that sets them free. It's not reading the Bible.
Well, of course it did. Holy Spirit was all over that idea, wasn't he? Yeah, you still do. Thank you. I know. Isn't that the truth? And, and, it, and how exciting it is it when you find a newborn with a sincere desire to know more about the Lord that just saved her? Yeah. Hoo -ah. Here I'm in, the, I'm in Acts 2.30, uh, 29. Brethren, I confidently say to you regarding the patriarch David that he both died, was buried, and his tomb is with us today. And so because he was a prophet and knew that God had sworn to him with an oath to seat one of his descents upon the throne, he looked ahead and spoke of the resurrection of Christ, that he was neither abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh suffer decay. This, that, see, he's talking about Messianic prophecy. This Jesus God raised up again, to which we are all witnesses. Therefore, having been exalted to the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured forth this which you both see and hear. For it was not David who ascended into heaven, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Set at my right hand until I make thine enemies a footstool for thy feet. Therefore let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you've crucified. Listen, he brought that out, didn't he? Look at that key verse in there. For us, that key verse. And you know what? He talked about session, right? Seated. He talked about session and then leaving that seated position in the second coming uh, for Operation Footstool. He made that, a, the, he made that connection very clear. He sets and then he leaves. And when he leaves from his seated, seated position in heaven, Operation Footstool will be activated. Then we go to Hebrews, the first chapter of Hebrews. We're in the 10th. In the first chapter of Hebrews. In, in verse 4, he starts this. I'm in Philemon. Uh, in 4, I picked this thing up in 4. Actually, you should pick it up in 1. I just picked it up in 4. Having become as much better than angels, superior to angels, Listen, you realize that Jesus, when he came to the world, the son of the only begotten son of God was was made inferior to angels. You know why? His humanity. is perfect, but it was still inferior. You'll know, you'll learn that tomorrow night. As he has inherited more excellent name than they, the angels and and to which angels did he ever say, Thou art my son, today hath been gotten thee. And again, I will be a father to him, and he shall be a son to me. All messianic prophecies. And when he brings the firstborn into the world, he says, Let all the angels of God worship him. And of the angels, he says, Who made his angels win and his ministers a flame of fire? But of the son, he says, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. And the righteous is, a sepulcher, uh, is the sepulcher of his kingdom. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, thy God, has anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy companions. And thou, Lord, in the beginning didst lay the foundation of the earth. And the heavens are the work of thy hands. They will perish, but thou remainest. They all will become old as garments and a mantle. Thou will roll up. Thou will roll them up as a garment. They will also be changed. But thou art the same and thy years will not come to an end. But to which of the angels has he ever said, set at my right hand until I make thine enemies a footstool for thy feet? Are they not angels? Are they not all ministering? Spirits sent out to render service for the sake of those who inherit salvation. Question. Yeah, question for you to understand doctrinally. As, look, in all of that discussion, all those messianic stuff, he took you all the way from the first coming to the second coming. Boom, there it is. See, he talked about first coming, second coming. Talked it as a one, one unit when we actually know it's two. 
there's a first coming, church age, and a second coming. It's just kind of interesting. It's kind of interesting. You know what's really interesting about chapter 1? That goes into chapter 2? You know what's really interesting about Hebrews chapter 1 and 2? He says to us, You should be careful to understand a very important principle with God. The angels who were created perfect volitionally chose against, to go against God and his plan. He offered them salvation. They rejected it. And he put the judgment of the lake of fire upon them. And you should be aware of that in the midst of your arrogance as a human being to think that somehow... You're greater than all that God has created in this world and that it's not important for you to believe the gospel of Jesus Christ that in some way you're arrogant to think you will take your chances in the next life. This is probably gobbledygook. Because when you read chapter 1 and chapter 2, it's a really indictment. It's all about the superiority of Jesus Christ came into this world inferior and somehow became superior how did he do it? By obedience to go to the cross and die for our sins, be buried and raised from the dead. Ascended back to the Father, was seated in the right hand of God the Father, and at that point became superior in his humanity to angels. Listen to me now. And as a result of that, we become seated in Christ, right? I taught you that the other day. We become seated in Christ. Moment of salvation, baptized by the Holy Spirit into Christ. We are now seated in Christ. Listen to me now. In a superior position in Christ, in a, in a superior position to angels, including the devil and the fallen ones. Whoa. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The principle is that God made the human soul to study the Bible categorically. We learn everything we learn in life, we learn categorically. Right? Yeah, well, you go 100. You study something in school, you, you study 100, which is basic. Then you go to 200. Then you go to advanced because it's categorical. We're, we're built to think that way. God built our soul. Uh, the, our mentality is built that way. Frame of reference, memory centers, retention, all of that. Mm -hmm. What makes us different, yeah, the thing that makes us different is that we have understood that. I, I've, I well understand it because I grew under it. As soon as I got to a categorical teacher, I, I just, I didn't get it through going to theological training. I got it through studying the Bible categorically under the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And so we teach ice. What makes us uniquely different than the average church out there is we teach ice. Isagogies, that's historical looking at stuff. Categories, which is the bulk of where you grow spiritually and uh, milk meat. Mm -hmm. now, the bigger question for you is God drug you a long way to get you to where you are. 2,400 miles. Out of where? Massachusetts, Connecticut. 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 They all seem the same up there to me. <laughs> kind of like down south. We don't know Georgia from Alabama and Mississippi. Um, and the question, for, the bigger question for you in life is why did he drag you all the way down here to set you in this little dinky church right here. Don't miss my question. Don't miss my question now. Don't miss my question with a bunch of answers. Pay attention to my question. Why do you think he brought you 2,400 miles down here to set you where you are? To teach you what he's teaching you. Now, I'm asking you to give an answer for it because I don't know that you could give me an answer, but you need to find the answer to that question. 
Okay, well, we're going to talk. There you go. Okay. Yeah. Well, God knew that you need to be taught a little more. There you go. Well, thank you, Jesus. All right. That's all right. Listen, he drug you far and he drug me. Drug me how many miles? 800? 800. Yeah, 800. Drug me 800. You drug, Boy, you went three times. You, you must have been kicking and screaming. I was just screaming. screaming. Um, and then we come to our passage, which is Hebrews 10, 9 through 14. And, of course, I'm, behold, I've come to do your will, Jesus said, to take away the first in order to establish the second. That, that he said, I've come to do your will. To take away the first in order to establish the second. I doubt if that was a gate question, that would be the first thing, answer that came to our mind. But there's so many answers to that question that probably any question you gave it dealt with the crucifixion of Christ to be okay. But uh, and then uh, having, having offered one sacrifice for sin for all time, sat down at the right hand of God the Father. That's in Hebrews 1, 3, and 4. Waiting from that time forward, church age, until his enemies be made the footstool. That's the second coming. Point number four. Now look, hey. I understand that I fly. I don't go as fast as Joel, but but I, I know I do know I fly, and I've tried to slow myself down. But if you don't study outside of class, you're gonna miss half the stuff I teach you. I mean you've got to go back and look at this stuff and read it and let the Holy Spirit teach you more than I could possibly know. But I, I have an hour. Now, if I was in a whole Bible study and we had an open end because I have to shut this thing down an hour because of the Internet. If I was in a whole Bible study, we, we'd talk. Uh, we'd shut this thing down anytime you had a question. We'd shut it down and talk about it. I didn't care where we, how long, if you was willing to stay two hours, you know, other than I'd have to make a call home. But other than that one. Well, Jesus sets in session, point four, four while Jesus sets in session, Sets in, you know, that's hard to say real fast, at least for me. Operation Footstool, listen to me. Operation Footstool is a messianic prophecy. Agreed? I'm teaching it tonight as a messianic prophecy. The difference is, I'm living in the reality of that prophecy. Well, when it was given in Psalms 110, we still had to have the first coming of Christ to even get to where we are. You see, we know the first coming has come, and we know the second one's on his way. So this is on our doorstep, isn't it? It's not way back there. It's right up here. <laughs> it's up in our face, buddy. This prophecy is still prophecy, though, but it's prophecy of the second coming, and the second coming is right on our doorstep. Would you agree with that? call the rapture we call it the eminence I mean ticking like a clock waiting from that time onward session waiting from session until he leaves his seat to return when Jesus leaves the right hand of God the Father or session this prophecy will begin to be fulfilled in as stated in Acts 2, 35, 36, when Peter preached it to the Jews at Pentecost. First, there will be the rapture of the church, 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18, 1 Corinthians 15, 50, 58. Then the seven years of tribulation of the Jewish age, that's Daniel's 70th week, Revelation 5 through 19, then Operation Footstool. I want to tell you, I want you to be a little more informed about Operation Footstool, so I'm going to lay it out to you in four phases. Because this is one of the big things up on the agenda. This is one of these prophecies that could be, I mean, once the church is raptured, we're, we're in the operation of it, aren't we? Okay. Here's the first phase. The first phase of Operation Footstool begins at the end of the tribulation with the victory 
of the war of Armageddon. You know why that's important? Uh, phase two, because when that happens, phase two happens. The operation, phase two of Operation Footstool, as soon as Armageddon's over, which is Revelation 19, 20 through the 20th chapter, verse 7. Did I put 16, 16, and 14, 20 on your paper? Yeah, those are important passages connected with this of, of Armageddon. You know that, I think, either, I'm not quite sure now, it's either 16, 16, or 14, 20, where they talk about the blood, how high the blood will flow in that valley. Uh, 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 up to the horse's bridle in that valley, 200 miles. 200 miles. I mean, buddy, that's a that's a whole lot of stuff in it. it. It's in one of those passages, and so I put it in there uh, to tell you. It's in one of them. I forget which one. Uh, the second phase of Operation Footstool will be Satan as angels. As soon as the War of Armageddon is over, this phase two occurs. Satan and his angels, we call them fallen, will be kept, will be then put in Tatarsis, uh, the angelic prison for a thousand years of the millennium. You can read about that in Revelation 20, 1 through 6. They often refer to it as the abyss. Second Peter 2, 4 is where you learn the name of it. Then phase three of Operation Footstool involves Satan and his angels being released from the prison the angelic prison at the end of the millennium to be defeated in the second key battle, the war of Gog and Magog, Revelation 20, 7 through 10. This is all Operation Footstool. Every bit of this. Then comes phase four. Phase four of Operation Footstool after the war, victory of the war. See, listen to me. Why am I talking about victory of wars? Please tell me. Why am I talking about, I brought up two great victories of them at the second coming of Christ. Why? Mm, give me more. What's, what's the title of my lesson? What, what, what's footstool about? Putting his foot on the defeated enemy's neck. Wow. Oh. Right? This is a key. These two great victories. You understand? On both sides of the angelic prison. Right? Uh, then we have phase four of Operation Footstool. Will be Satan when the war is over. Then Operation Footstool will be when Satan and his angels are cast into the lake of fire. Revelation 20 verses 7 through 10. 10 being the key, and Matthew 25, 41. Now, I want you to go to Matthew. I want to show you something out of Matthew 25, 41. Because Le Jesus, he puts this piece of information that's really important to us in Operation Footstool. We did not have this in Psalms. He gives us a prophetic peek into operation. Listen to what he says. 2541. And he's talking about part of the second coming of the judgment of nations. In verse 41, then he will also say to those on his left. He's had him divided into the left and the right. And what happens to him? Then he will say to those on his left. Depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire, which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. See the word prepared? Yeah, uh -huh. yeah, that's that deal. Let me show you something. H-E-T-O-I-N. 
M-A-Z-O is the word prepared in the Greek language. It's the word prepared. Okay? It's not an uncommon Greek word, but it is the Greek word for prepared. But here's what's interesting. This is a perfect passive. Participle in the Greek language. What's perfect mean? Completed in the past, with the results, it remains completed unless God states otherwise forever. At what point in eternity past would that have been determined? Well, yes, in a technical sense, eternal life conference. But something else happened in eternity past that brought this into, into reality. See, where the participles is putting us into a re reality doctrine. The revolt, come on. Right? The revolt called the angelic conflict, that's where it started when he revolted against the plan of God, which the centerpiece was Jesus Christ, right? revolted and we had an angelic war right there angelic conflict a war and satan we're going to see this on wednesday wednesday night studies at the conclusion of this war and and who do you think on god's side won that war well in the angelic sphere what archangel do you think won that war who is the war angel? Now, Gabriel is the teaching angel. Who's the go Michael. 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 Yeah. And and listen, there's reference, other references like in Revelation where My Michael is the deal. But anyhow, he wins the war and God sentenced the fall Satan and the fallen angels. Listen to this. Then he will say in the future, he will say out there, judgment at the great white throne judgment business depart from me cursed ones into the eternal fire in other words everybody who stands before the great white throne judgment because they've rejected the gospel of christ is going to go to the lake of fire we know that in revelation the 20th chapter it tells us that 10 through 15 all right when was the lake of fire and for what reason was at what point was the lake of fire created? Come out of this, didn't it? Come out of the judgment. That's what mine says. Depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire, which the eternal fire, which is now called in Revelation called the lake of fire, which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. It was created in eternity past. I personally, I per personally know now whether it was before verse one, but it was identified between verse one and two in Genesis. Now, whether it was create, whether it was created beyond that, because if you believe Guam, creation begins with God, universe, angels, and man, the order of creation then it, it, it could have been designed before or between. Because the perfect tense says this thing, this is where this whole thing, came, and, and what was prepared from this eternity past? Perfect tense, passive voice. There's something, something the, the, the lake of fire, something happened in the eternity past to cause that. To become a doctrinal principle, part of simple, a doctrinal principle. And the principle is talking about the lake of fire, which had been prepared not for us, not for hu the human race, but before the human race came into existence, it had already been set in stone, so to speak, speaking for Moses, Right? That's the power of the Greek language. I love that. Perfect passive participle. 
now. If you reject the gospel, because the whole thing was, the whole centerpiece of the plan of God is Jesus Christ coming to the cross, die, be buried, raised from the dead, the third day, which is the gospel. Those who reject that gospel, according to Revelation, will go to the great white throne judgment, not because of sin. Listen, Christ don't come back the second time for sin. He can, that's, remember, we talked about that in Hebrews 9, 28. He comes back the second time in regard for deliverance. But if you go before the great white throne judgment, it's because you've rejected the gospel of Jesus Christ and you're going to be cast in a lake of fire. It was never prepared for you. It was prepared for whom? But if you're going to follow him in rebellion against the gospel of Jesus Christ, that's where you're going to go. People listen to me on the internet. You need to understand that. Don't let anybody, don't let any, listen, the only person that don't want you to get saved and not go to hell is the devil because he's headed there. Don't listen to all that foolishness out there. Listen to people damn your soul. Well, anyhow, yeah. No, he won't. That's right. You got that right. Think about that. Not only will we be fighting, but listen, we'll be setting as judges. Think about that. Church age is a powerful thing. You have no idea how important you are in the kingdom's prophetic word. <laughs> right. I hear you. I have no idea, but I'm excited about it. Okay. I've, I've got you about as far as I can go tonight. And so we have prayer. Let's, let's close this service out. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for these who have come tonight with open hearts, open minds, open ears, both by automobile and by internet. We've given a lot of information. We've recorded the scriptures and it requires after our studies. If you want to know the truth and the truth that will set you free, you've got to study it and let the Holy Spirit teach it to you. I've just introduced it. It needs to be really studied. We haven't studied it. I've just taught it. I've introduced it through teaching. There's a massive amount of information here. And the Holy Spirit, as they go into these scriptures like we did tonight, you begin to look at it and say, why is this and what's going on? The Holy Spirit will tell you he will teach you. He will set you free. That you can have, you can have confidence about things that are future, not just things that are present. Encourage our hearts tonight, Father, for the coming of Christ. May we be blameless at his coming. Blameless and functional preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, sharing the truth with suffering people that none would go to the lake of fire. It's our responsibility now. Jesus said to Nicodemus, I've come for the lost, the perishing. Little probably did they understand what that meant if they died without Christ, as we do tonight. Encourage our hearts, Father, to be faithful in our witness in these last days of the importance of the gospel of Jesus Christ. For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. The Bible says that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not counting our sins against us. He made Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin for us.